Um, hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, for for joining. So we have uh, 68 participants. Uh, um, so the point of this, this is run by uh, uh, Economics for Inclusive Prosperity and uh, which Danny and Gabriel and I kind of started to air kind of uh, some of the ideas that are new in economics and just kind of having uh, uh, an open conversation about changes that are happening in economics. And one thing we sort of thought would be good to do is kind of have a public facing conversation between uh, economic historians and historians who share a lot of the same actual underlying like uh, source material, but have very different uh, uh, styles and methodologies. And uh, we should thought let's air them and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and see what comes up. And uh, so I don't want to say anymore. We have we have a very distinguished panel uh, with with uh, Gavin Wright uh, moderating, and then we'll have Caitlin Rosenthal, Shari Eli, John Levy, and Trevon Logan, um, and we'll take it from there. Um, and uh, so, Gavin, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Suresh, and thanks to you and to all the other uh, organizers for bringing this group together. Uh, it's a topic that is much in need of discussion. Uh, the great divide between economic history, which is now mainly practiced in economics departments, uh, and historians. I've actually prepared some remarks, and I'm going to try to zip through them uh, quickly as I can. Uh, but I think it'll be quicker if I read a little bit. Uh, I attended grad school at Yale. I'm taking advantage of my status as a senior member here to recount some history uh, in the late 1960s when the new economic history was on the ascendancy. Although the new economic history was mainly in economics, the broader field of economic history clearly included at that time members of both parent disciplines. At Yale, history grad students like Jan de Vries and Fred Karstensen could do an economic history track by taking a few core econ courses. There was also a fair amount of common cause with a movement then called the New Social History interested in pursuing quantification to help write history from the bottom up. When I started at Michigan in 1972, there were two card carrying economic historians in the history department, Sylvia Thrupp and Jacob Price and similar lineups were not unusual elsewhere. This era of coexistence came to an abrupt end with the publication of Time on the Cross by Fogel and Engerman in 1974. The book was controversial, not just because of its claims about slavery in the United States, that slavery was efficient, productive, and not all bad for the slaves, but because these claims were presented as a summation of research by cleometric economic historians over the previous decade or more. Even though some of the most robust critiques came from within economic history, many historians felt that any discipline that could generate such an offensive brand of history did not deserve respectful intellectual status. In truth, history was probably going its own way toward the cultural turn anyway. To the extent that economic history had anything to do with this move, it would have been a reaction to the observation that much of the new work seems drawn moth-like to the discovery of markets and market processes in history, concluding that markets worked. Now I'm gonna try sharing screen and see if I can have you uh, look at, uh, here we go. Uh, look at this quotation from Robert Lucas, uh, which is that uh, the central lesson of research in economic history is that neoclassical economics applies anytime, anywhere. This now seems like something of a caricature, but for the new economic history, roughly through the 1970s, Lucas was largely correct. A case in point that mattered to many historians was the agricultural regime of the postbellum South. Works published in the 1970s by Joseph Reed, Stephen DeCanio, Robert Higgs all concluded that sharecropping was not an exploitive economic form and that any racial oppression that did occur was rooted in politics rather than markets. Small wonder that historians found little to attract them in this style of research. True One Kind of Freedom by Roger Ransom and Rich, Richard Such published 1977 was an important counterweight 
Although this book was a major contribution to cleometrics, its analytical foundation did not seem especially powerful. Territorial monopoly in the rural credit market, a condition that applied as much to white as to black small farmers. The role of race in their account remained underdeveloped. A strong reaction to this state affairs occurred during the 1980s. One landmark was the session at the 1984 American Economic Association meetings organized by Bill Parker, resulting in a slim volume called Economic History and the Modern Economist. Contributors made the case that economic history should be understood as, as a distinct approach to the study of economic life, not merely applied economics with old data. Using the QWERTY typewriter keyboard as a central metaphor, Paul David advanced the view that some historical economic processes are governed by increasing returns and path dependence, whereby events of the remote past exercise continuing influence on the present. Also encouraged by a rejuvenated Douglas North, economic historians began to rediscover the importance of institutions as carriers of history. As an illustration of the changing worldview of economic historians, consider this statement by Claudia Golden. And I've got to find a way to do this. How about this? Okay, uh, you can read it yourself. This is from her book on understanding the gender gap published in 1990. I began this study more as an economist, but I've ended with a fuller appreciation of how the distant past affects the present, how norms and expectations impede change, how discrimination can survive even in highly competitive markets and how slow genuine change can be. And I highlight Claudia because I don't want you to think I'm just giving you the Stanford line here uh, about the right way to think about economic history. Claudia, I knew as a grad student at Chicago and she certainly came on a very different track and it was, I think, trying to think through the status of women in economic history that led her to rethink the field more broadly. I began my own review of her book in the Journal of Economic Literature with this statement. Economic history is in the midst of a quiet revolution. Two decades ago, cleometricians were bent on showing that economic analysis could be applied even to the study of far off times and places. More recently, economic historians have begun to take a more assertive posture toward the discipline, defending the distinctiveness of historical approaches and advocating the essentiality of history to comprehending modern issues. Were we perhaps engaged in self-deluding wishful thinking? Perhaps so. But there were others who also saw significant progress. Uh, and as evidence on this, I include this quote from Howell Harris, a British uh, historian with a, an American specialty. Uh, who commented in 2002, the Journal of Economic History's editors have made a successful effort to require contributors to write clearly and to explain themselves. There is a wealth of readable novel work on, for example, invention during the 19th century, industrial revolution, labor market behavior in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, racial and other discrimination in urban industrial labor markets and the economics of depression and recovery in the 30s and 40s. The new self-image of economic history is perhaps illustrated by this remark from a referee's report that came in when I was editor of the Journal of Economic History. This paper may be good enough for the AER, but it does not meet the standards of the JEH. Despite these ostensibly successful gains in standards and aspirations, history and economics history today are more divided than ever. What went wrong? Looking back, I can now see that most of our attention was devoted to historicizing the discipline of economics rather than making the field itself truly interdisciplinary. It's not that we have lapsed back into the rigid world of economic orthodoxy. Economics today is far more eclectic and philosophically diverse than in, in, when I was in grad school. However, any progress we may have made in making economic history more palatable to historians has been swamped by a deep change in prevailing methodology, which I identify as the rise and entrenchment of identification econometrics as the standard methodology for all of economics. This approach has become all pervasive, including among economic history students. Bob Margo, Bob Margo has documented the trends in his article, The Integration of Economics and Economic History, but they are obvious to the naked eye to anyone who attends seminars or meets with grad students to discuss research plans. 
In my view, this approach is extremely constraining as a one size fits all way of writing economic history. Whatever else one may say about it, the resulting publications are deadly from the standpoint of fostering interdisciplinary communication. To be sure, the very best economic history studies do it all, meet the professional standards of applied economics while fleshing out the historical context and building a narrative. But even when well done, the outputs are deadly for promoting conversation with historians. Uh, I've got a few suggestions for uh, what to do from here, uh, but I will leave that for the later discussion. Uh, that's my two cents. Let's continue on down with the panel. And I'm now uh, assuming the role of moderator. And we agreed on uh, this order, alternating disciplinary uh, origins here. And so our next speaker will be uh, just across the bay from me, Caitlin Rosenthal from Berkeley. Thank you, Gavin, and thank you all for coming. Um, you know, I've been thinking about what I was going to say this week, and you know, it might be because you caught me at the end of a particularly grouchy week of Zoom kindergarten, but I think I'm going to be a little bit cranky, and I apologize if most of that crankiness is aimed at uh, my colleagues in economics a little bit more than history. And I have plenty of advice for historians as well and how we can be more interdisciplinary. But you know, reading Gavin's um, remarks, which he shared with us, made me think about how I ended up here in what I sometimes feel like is some kind of like a peacemaker role where I'm trying to get people who never talk to each other to talk to each other. And so instead of making peace, I'm gonna be cranky today. So I um, can start in graduate school too. I went to graduate school 40 years after Gavin, uh, when instead of the new economic history, the new history of capitalism was brewing. Uh, this is a field that was self-consciously defining itself against economic history because of what it saw as a failure to grapple adequately with the role of power in politics. From the beginning, I have been a bit uncomfortable in with this identification, but I've grown to actually embrace it over time during a period when I think more people have become frustrated with it. But at the time in graduate school, um, I was coming not from a history undergraduate, but from a stint as a management consultant. And I did what all of my undergraduates tend to do. I thought, oh, of course, economic history, history and economics, they must go together naturally. So I just started showing up um, in the economic history workshop in econ and in workshops in history. And I only came to know after the fact how um, far apart those two sets of conversations were. Um, Claudia Golden, who Gavin so eloquently quoted from, co-advised my dissertation, and little did I realize at the time how rare um, people like Claudia were who really understood and grappled with the context, who thought statistics were important but weren't obsessed with identification. But I started, you know, ever, at least a few times a semester I would march up to the economics department where I learned a lot of the language, got a taste of the, for the, of the obsession with identification and causality, and grew a thick skin for a style of debate that seemed downright hostile uh, when I first arrived. Now, you have to bear in mind that I was coming from management consulting, which is a setting where people very often pipe up um, to share dubious expertise on things they don't know that much about. So this wasn't that much of a, uh, an adaptation. And, and yet, I would find myself asking my, so the person sitting next to me, if this was a particularly bad paper, like they must hate this, right? They haven't even let the person get to the argument, much less share any of the context. As someone who, as I mentioned, was a management consultant, but also a kind of grouchy high school debater who never had a problem opening my mouth, this was the first time in my life where I found myself needing the advice that I gave to my shyest undergraduate students. Whatever you do, make sure to say one thing. Put your hand up early so you can get a word in. And I would start coaching myself that this is what I needed in order to be successful. And I think that I don't want to dwell on culture of economics, but this is one area where if you actually want historians, it might be a good area to start. But as a result of being in this, you know, combative economic history environment, but also one that really valued history, I finished graduate school buoyed by optimism that even that there was going to be room for new collaboration. Now, a decade later, I have to say that I'm not so sure. Um, and I've been trying to think about why I'm not optimistic because at the end of graduate school, I thought I wasn't optimistic um, basically because we weren't sitting in the same spaces enough and we didn't speak each other's language. 
And I still think that that's probably the solution to the problem is getting people in the same room so we can actually begin to understand each other. Because even if we don't get to the same questions, we work with a lot of the same material. So we should hopefully be able to contribute to each other's conversations. But I've come to feel like the thing that Gavin pointed to, the obsession with identification and causality um, is really at the root of the problem. Um, and not just, it's not because causality isn't important. It's because of the large number of econ seminars where I've gone to see a discussion about causality and somebody puts up a slide. I realized I should have been taking pictures so I could show you these slides. And there's like two things. And in between them, there's a causal arrow. And it's like property rights, arrow growth, or migration equals education, arrow. The end, those discussions usually have a context slide, but the context slide doesn't really inform the causality slide, which is the big takeaway. And, you know, I'm always sitting there asking, what kind of forced migration? Uh, slavery sure didn't increase education. What kind of property? Property and people? Property exploited for, expropriated from native peoples? In which case, perhaps it was the successful appropriation of property more than something slippery called property rights. Now, I'm someone who's often frustrated by my history colleagues' insistence on the fact that there were many causes or the ongoing deflection that it's more complicated than that. But I've come to feel like oversimplification is by far the bigger risk. Risk, And that's not really because of the simplicity itself. It's because of the very common behavior of insisting that questions themselves can be list lifted from context. And also the idea that these questions can be non-normative that you can put up these kind of causal questions about what's the relationship between property rights and growth, for example, and pretend that that's not a normative question. And if you can pretend that that's not a normative question, you can come up with a relationship and you can carry it off without paying attention to the context. And I think that this problem of believing a question can be non-normative is really at the root of some of the biggest misunderstandings and also the, the biggest kind of wrong conclusions uh, in debates about slavery and capitalism. You know, even before we started this discussion, there was mention of the downright offensive debates about whipping during the time on the cross debates where people concluded that there wasn't a lot of whipping because most people weren't being whipped that often. And historians were able to bring this context that actually, um, well, first of all, that might be quite often if you're thinking about yourself and your loved one being being whipped, but then also what happens when you think about how often you see a whipping and how, what does that tell us about the context of the plantation and the way that violence underpinned everything, the way violence is omnipresent. So the idea that we can ask these questions in ways that are not normative can just lead us in all kinds of bad directions. Um, and I feel like this plays out in our obsession with the question, did slavery cause capitalism? And the insistence that that question isn't saying anything normative. The asker of the question may be trying to ask it in a non-normative way, but I think it's very difficult um, to do so. So we've got all these questions. Did slavery cause capitalism? Did slavery cause economic takeoff? More narrowly, did slavery and violence cause increased rates of cotton picking? So what do those questions tell us? Well, they do tell us something about how economic change in the abstract works. But then I wonder what I do with the answer, whether it's yes or no, because neither of those things, whether the answer is yes or no, changes an answer to another question on which I wish we were spending our time, which is did slavery shape American capitalism, the economy we are living in today? And there we don't, we can get beyond the yes or no question because the answer is simply obviously yes. So if we have that obvious yes, and we get shift our conversation to how, and understanding the ways that slavery is still with us today, we have all kinds of new opportunities. What is our goal here? If we're thinking about this normatively, then our goal should be repair. Our goal should be reparations. And if so, the question we need to answer is a question about how the effects of capitalism are still with us today. So you've heard my little rant, which has been jumping about a bit, but I'll, I'll conclude with my advice for how to get past this for economists. And I think if I can, pretend that I know how to speak your language. The answer is more path dependence, less causality and identification. Because thinking about path dependence and slavery, how slavery shaped what came after is gonna open up all kinds of interesting conversations. And it also can lead us to conclusions that are not only interesting, but also useful for thinking about making things better. Now for historians, there's all kinds of other advice that I can give in a different complaint. A more comfort in training with data would be good and more dialogue is more important. But that brings me back to my, um, my grouchiness that I started with about culture. 
Um, because I'll tell you, as a graduate, as a, now as a professor, I take graduate students to visit The Economist. And at Berkeley, we're lucky to have some of the most welcoming economists out there, um, people who know a lot about history. But even so, I take them and really they never want to go back. So how can we get these historians who care a lot about the past, some of whom are interested in quantification via digital history, they don't know a lot of statistics, but they're interested and they're curious um, to keep coming back because that's gonna help us to get to a conversation that takes context seriously while also taking advantage of what we can do together. All right, thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. I can see that we're going to have a vigorous discussion uh, today but uh, let's move down our lineup of uh, opening statements. And the next speaker is Sherry Ela from Toronto. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, let me see if I can screen share this. Um, like a true economist, I've made some slides. Um, can you all see? Yeah, okay. Um, so I have to say first that I really agree with um, a lot of Caitlin's comments, especially on this issue of identification. Um, I went to graduate school um, at UC Berkeley and took um, uh, Barry Eichengreen and Brad DeLong's uh, economic history course. And one of the first papers that we read um, was Fogel's 1962 paper on the social savings of railroads. And the innovation of that paper was really that he took this really large complex problem of trying to see whether uh, railroads were indispensable to American economic growth in the late 19th century. And he brought data to the question and then created this counterfactual world in which we think, well, what would have happened without the railroad? Would there have been canal building? Um, and what, you know, what I tell my students about this paper is that it, it's taking a complex problem and bringing data so that we can get an estimate, a single estimate, um, and have really precise measurement. And economists are um, really interested in first, even before identification, really precise measurement. And so things that are easy to measure are births, deaths, height, weight. Uh, we could be relatively sure about about these numbers more than can about things that are really hard to measure like race, attitudes, perception. Um, and economists and, and in some settings remain really silent on these issues because it's so difficult um, to put them into, uh, to really quantify them. Uh, we fast forward from Fogel's work in the early 1960s to uh, work today in economic history, and there's this proliferation of papers um, using big data, right? And this is because there are now um, research researchers have more access to archival records than ever before. Many of them are online. They're on Ancestry, Family Search, MyHeritage, Jenny.com. They include an unbelievable amount of of information from census records to war records, gravestones. You know, you could follow somebody from, from birth all the way till death and then find their uh, children and grandchildren. You can see in yearbooks um, if they were voted most likely to succeed, you can get an incredible amount of information on people. And so um, this has led us to be able to answer really big questions like questions about factors that influence social mobility, um, questions on intergenerational mobility, right? Questions on these really long run effects um, of government programs, uh, which is something that, that I'm, I'm interested in these days. Um, and so what's the contribution of this recent research in economic history using big data? Well, you know, one way to think about this is to think about issues of intergenerational mobility. Suppose we, we didn't use uh, big data. We didn't uh, try to uh, quantify and measure really well. Um, you know, if you just look at case studies and narratives, if you consider context, you might you might miss uh, certain things. So, for example, um, narrative evidence might not be so informative. Narratives can be deceptive or self-serving. 
And you know, you'll, you'll have to grapple with this. Individuals may downplay privilege, right? Then if we think about um, trying to answer these questions about the uh, very long run effects of let's say a welfare program or a new deal era program, um, there are certain things that economists can bring to the table, like creating these, these links to all kinds of information, let's say housed at the Social Security Administration. So you could link um, an individual born in the early 20th century to outcomes like disability, income earned in adulthood, um, age of death that you will get from Social Security. And you can get these by having um, the tools and, and methods that uh, come from economics and that are uh, used by by economic historians. And you know it, this a lot of this is just totally in, infeasible without um, methods that economic historians have borrowed from uh, computer science, from statistics to try and and link individuals, right? Um, economic historians are are really very interdisciplinary in nature, at least in my view and, and how I've experienced them. Okay, so, so I agreed with many of the, the um, sort of issue, issues that Caitlin raised with very many of them. So what are some drawbacks of this push toward big data and identification and being able to make these really causal comments that um, rely on statistical methods um, and make econo modern economic history work pretty inaccessible to historians. So one big issue very fundamentally without even thinking about identification issues or any statistics is that if we're insistent on this measurement um, and, and precise measurement, then we are often not um, undertaking work on people who are hard to measure. So white men, are, are easy to link and track and find in historical records, especially those, those who are born in the US, but that's not the case for um, African-Americans, women, other minorities, um, and it's not the case for uh, specifically African-American women. So in cases where individuals are difficult to find, change their last name, um, are illiterate, um, it's 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 very hard for an economist interested in precise measurement to um, undertake work that that is going to be appealing to uh, folks in 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 economics and to be publishable in in top journals. Um, and then the other issue that really strikes me is that. Research questions often get get really narrow, which Caitlin, I think, is is what you were um, talking about. And what I think, you know, apart from this like the search for shocks and accidents that divide populations into treatment and control, so that we can make causal claims, you know, if you take the whole, if you if you take sometimes um, the literature in economic history on a, on a particular topic, um, and you put these, these papers together, sometimes you get such a loss of, of context and you wonder, or at least I wonder, if we're moving toward uh, viewing history as like these series of accidents where we just find shocks and then we, we um, assess um, based on these on these shocks and losing opportunities to put it all together and, and, and provide context. And I think that's what historians do really well in books. Um, and I think that the, I'm actually very optimistic about the future. Um, I think that there are, I think economists have an enormous uh, need for the work that historians do. And I think um, hopefully we could argue vice versa, that this um, quantification and measurement and um, these moments when um, work may seem reductive is, is, is actually uh, useful for these questions that are really hard to get at 
um, using uh, methods typically used by, by historians. And I would say um, the way forward is um, books, is to write more books and for economists to somehow be encouraged um, and, and rewarded for context. Okay, uh, that, that concludes my, my thoughts. Thank you very much, Shari. Yeah, and uh, all right, let's uh, move back to the history side uh, and hear from Jonathan Levy, who I would say is speaking from Chicago, except that I think maybe he's in Italy. That's right. Uh, so good morning, um, good afternoon. Thank you, David. Uh, it's a, it's a, I'm thrilled that this, this panel um, exists and also that there's so many people willing to, to show up for it. It's already been um, fascinating. I guess I too, although I agree with much of what Caitlin said, uh, I'm actually optimistic about the possibility of a, of a revival of interdisciplinary communication between economists, historians, economic historians. Uh, that's an optimism that's justified, I think, but it does come in the face of some pretty dispiriting occasions. Uh, I'll, I'll recount just, just one. I once asked a member of the economics department where I teach, which is Chicago, why doesn't your department hire more of any economic historians? And his response was, you know, he thought about it for a second and said, well, you know, any economist could be a historian tomorrow if they wanted to be. It just means you would choose to work uh, with old data, and why would you do that? New data um, is better. So, so there are some potential disciplinary gaps. I don't think they have much to do with commonly cited dividing lines, having to do with quantification, having to do with transhistorical assumptions about economic rationality. I think they have to do, it's come up already, with uh, different expositions of argument uh, as they relate to the analytical problem uh, of time and temporality. So let me just explain what I mean by that very briefly. Historians, it's already come up, argue in narrative, and narrative entails, among other qualities, uh, first, an appreciation of the faithfulness of time, uh, that an action, an event, once occurred, an experience remains lodged in time, uh, irrevocably altering a situation, so you can't bounce back to, say, a position of of equilibrium, that time is faithful. I think that's one reason why historians don't think of the past as a mere reservoir of data. Instead, they believe that you can't understand the present unless you appreciate how it's unfolded uh, from the past. A and that means that points in time uh, cannot be abstracted from one another and treated as discrete for purposes uh, of analysis. Second, historians believe in temporal heterogeneity. Uh, that means first appreciating the simultaneity of many short, medium, and long run historical processes. So historians do not see themselves uh, as tasked with rising above the contingency uh, of everyday life to find law-like governing regularities. It said we're always trying to relate that the complex ways that enduring patterns like say um, demographic trends or consistent cultural beliefs interact with more punctual uh, temporalities at stake in, say, uh, electoral politics or, or individual decisions. And, and specifying these and other relationships through narrative is the main analytical challenge and joy of history. Uh, it, it implies further that time is also not smoothly continuous. Instead, it's lumpy. So there are moments of transformation when historical processes can accelerate. Uh, even while others exhibit remarkable continuity. So uh, take racial inequality, extraordinary transformations, abolition of slavery, civil rights revolution, uh, yet the troubling endurance of, of racism, whose qualities itself exhibit both continuity and change, uh, endurance and transformation. Finally, uh, a corollary uh, of temporal heterogeneity is, is causal heterogeneity. Um, from what I can tell, you know, it, it's come up, you know, many economic historians, not all, not always, privilege a certain kind of exposition of argument, which often uh, demands calling for isolating unique uh, explanatory variables. 
Now, the best historical narratives feature, uh, I think, very sophisticated treatments of temporality and causation. Uh, but they nonetheless can come across to economic historians as insufficiently precise and insufficiently rigorous. Uh, whereas at the same time, to historians, uh, economists, uh, causal arguments, while this is a little bit of a jab, sorry, while performing uh, rigor, performing precision, uh, can appear woefully simplistic uh, and uninformed. So I, I think that's you know, those judgments, that's the root of, of, the, of the discord as I see it. But I, I do very much agree with David's first person account of what went wrong uh, in the American Academy. I mean, I emphasize American. Uh, and as narratives go, it, it's a fairly tragic one. I mean, basically an almost 50 year misunderstanding that first arose from a, a polemical controversy surrounding one book, you know, just one book that was published before, you know, I was born. And, and yes, you know, Robert Lucas said that, it makes me mad, but I, I could pull equally dim-witted quotes from historians uh, with just knee-jerk re reactions against anything smacking of economic reasoning, anything smacking of just quantification. I, I think it's a new moment now. I think history is post-cultural turn. Uh, digitization has brought about new data that creates new opportunities. There's certainly new interest among my history graduate students in the social sciences broadly, that includes uh, economics. I think it's a shame that in the last decade, old debates often born of ignorance uh, over the economics of racial slavery have flared up. I see that mostly as a, a kind of unfortunate picking of an old scab. Uh, I don't think we're kind of doomed to remain locked in these, in these debates. Now, you know, this has been said already, I'll, I'll echo it. I wouldn't subscribe to any economic history that only marshals quantitative evidence, but there's no reason. I mean, I can't think of one why historians should not employ quantitative methods. There's no good reason why historians can't make use of standard insights from economic theory, any less so than insights from cultural, political, or social theory to make sense of a wide variety of historical processes. Uh, you know, increasing returns is not you know, rocket science. Equally, there's no reason why economists can't better appreciate the faithfulness of the past uh, or the temporal and causal heterogeneity that historians take such pains uh, to narrate in their work. At least I can't think of a reason. Now, another cause for my optimism, I am speaking today from, from, from Italy, as Gavin said, where I spend a lot of time here with my wife's family, but you know, meeting folks the problems we're addressing are largely American problems. I find it much easier to talk to economists and economic historians here and throughout Europe, even the UK, uh, that I do in uh, Chicago or, or much of the US. So as far as what to do, just briefly, I have a, a sexy candidate and that's curricular reform. Um, now, one of the reasons why I find it easier to communicate with European scholars, European economists, I find they more often studied history, sociology, anthropology as undergraduates, as opposed to say, you know, physics or mathematics. There's nothing wrong with that, of course. Um, I started a, a track along with others in an undergraduate major at Chicago to get more future uh, doctoral students in economics to pass through, have taken more history, political science, philosophy coursework. Uh, it's something I'd like to join with other universities in promoting. At the graduate level, it used to be most U U.S. history, American history PhD programs offered a graduate course in quantitative or statistical methods. Uh, my department, it used to be to get a PhD in history, you had to fulfill two language requirements. So if you were a French historian, you know, you had to have French and German, but you could also do French and having fulfilled a requirement in statistical methods. Uh, that ended in the 1980s. Uh, I, I'd like to bring something like that back. I mean, I make my students at Chicago take a course with Rick Hornbeck at our business school, and they become at minimum you know, informed consumers of economic history. But it's also the case that oftentimes their own research has, has changed. They learn new uh, inter interpretive tools. Now, I would actually put this question to Gavin, but I, I think, and others, but I, I think most US economics departments, like all, for most of the 20th century, always had economic history or history of economic thought courses. And that more recently that, that's, that's declined, that hasn't been as prominent. Certainly it's not the case um, so, much as, so much as I know 
uh, Chicago economics. So it'd, it'd be nice to go go back uh, in that direction again. So I, I think, you know, I'm already uh, somewhat of an old dog. I mean, it's probably going to be students whose brains are still plastic who are going to find, you know, the best possible potential for collaboration to create a truly interdisciplinary economic history. And I, I think if, you know, on both sides, if graduate curriculums don't signal that something is important, then students won't think it's important. And if departments don't have to teach a course, they don't have to hire someone who can competently teach it, uh, even if statistical methods or economic history isn't their primary research subject. And understandably, and you know, here's my attempt to reason like an economist, if there's no incentive to study a subject because you can't get a job with expertise in it, uh, you're not likely to pursue that topic um, as a graduate student. Uh, so I'll stop there. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, it should be obvious that uh, in selecting historians for today's panel, we didn't exactly do a random sample of the history profession where we got uh, two exceptional individuals. Trevon, we're not asking you to summarize or make sense of everything you've heard. Uh, please give us your own take and then we'll have an open discussion. Yes, uh, thank you, Gavin, and, and thanks for this uh, invitation to talk about these issues. The discussion I've heard so far reminds me of two pieces, incidentally written by Robert Fogel. Um, the first being the limits of quantitation, quantitative methods in history from, in the American Historical Review. And the second is three phases of plyometric research on slavery and its aftermath, which is a brief paper in the AER. And those issues that he was talking about, and I believe both of those papers are published before I was born, we're still talking about today. So something is either gone really, really right, that the question is so important that we must come back to it, but also really, really wrong in that it shouldn't take us 30 years or more than 30 years and frankly, more than 40 years, I don't wanna reveal my age, to answer any of these, uh, uh, of these questions. So let me start thinking about what I think about the value of, of economic history and what it's done, particularly broadly in the social sciences, but more particularly what it has done in history which I think at first was generative and then led to something that was destructive. Paying attention to measurement is important. And I, I'm still very, very much um, convinced that the things that economic historians have done, both in their external interactions and internal discussions, which are very intense, as has been noted, are about accurate measurement. This is not only something that is, should be important for economic historians, but I still would believe that economic historians have the highest standards of empirical research relative to other economists. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are the most tooled, but we're paying the most attention relative to economists about the data generation process. That does not mean that we're better than historians and that we're better than other social scientists in thinking about the context in which the data is generated but we're thinking about its quality in a much, um, a much more finer fashion. And we first turn that attention in to ourselves in thinking about national income accounting and other sorts of measures that we don't think about as economic history today, but these are very much economic history, bread and butter economic history issues. What is American GNP in 1875? before we have national income and product accounts. Those are fundamental economic history questions that economic historians answered and have had to refine over time as our understanding of the economy has uh, developed. So that's really important. It's also important that we've clarified many arguments, and this is a point that Fogel makes, that are implicitly quantitative and made them explicit. So I do think that is a really important contribution that we've made to not simply think about talking about things being greater or less than, but what do we really mean by that? If we really start thinking about the connections that we're making between implicitly quantitative statements, even placing them in or out of time and what they might mean in their implications, we have got to be precise about what we're talking about. Because if our, we're loose in our thinking, we might get the history wrong, we'll certainly get the economics wrong, and we'll get the measurement and everything else wrong. So I do think it has set those discussions in the right, uh, on the right path. And so the one issue then we have to think about is, but what questions do we ask as economic historians? And we have in the past taken really, really big questions 
underneath our professional um, obligation. And we've handled them quite poorly, right? We took big questions like American slavery and it was disastrous. So now we answer really, really small questions. <laughs> and I will never forget, I was in graduate school going to the economic history seminar and trying to convince one of my friends in demography to come along because I thought this talk would be really interesting. And he said, Teron, I really don't wanna go spend 90 minutes to hear about the effect it works if your house faces north and it was a sunny day over 30 degrees and it was at this longitude or latitude, nobody cares about that. And so I, I wanted to have something really smart to say in response, but I really couldn't because that's actually what we're doing now in economic history. So we've taken actually and gone and lost a lot of the breath that we should have, but it was because we did not handle the breadth of the topics that we covered in the past, particularly appropriately. And then I think we borrowed too much from modern economics, right? And that really is more about the disintegration of the relationship between economic history and, and, and traditional historians. And be that borrowing too much has changed the way that we actually practice our field. And I think we're losing our comparative advantage as a result. But I wanna get back to this point as we're, we're talking about, and I know one of the issues that we want to talk about is um, racial inequality. And this is something that Jonathan mentioned in his, in his discussion about sort of time. And, it, and it's really two points. I think that history, if I'm thinking about historiography, a word that economic historians use very rarely, unfortunately, we're always looking to the past to help us think about something that's happening today. Right, if we think about the revolutions in history and the cultural turn in history overall, and the women's history that's written, the African-American history that's written, and now the history of capitalism, reflect current concerns, right? And that's really important, right? So it's not just the fact that we have to be sort of thinking about the faithfulness of time. We have to be thinking about the faithfulness of this time as we write any history that we're thinking about. Right? That's an important context because we've all collectively, historians and economic historians, have dropped the ball in one particular dimension, right? I mentioned at the start that Vogel was talking about three phases, right? His third phase was the recovery of Black history. The recovery of Black history is not just racial inequality, but the recovery of Black history also allows us to think much more expansively about a number of things, right? The first is that we have to understand that race itself is the product of racism. It's not a precursor to racism, it's the product of racism. So if we're going to recover black history fully, as Fogel said that we should be doing after this wonderful, um, uh, after this wonderful knowledge creation about American enslavement, then we really have to think about the history itself of racism, right? But even more than that, we are still as historians and as economic historians falling into a very dangerous trap, right? I'm very convinced by the work say of Dorothy Roberts who tells us that race is not a social identity. It's a political category. And as a political category, it's inherently about the allocation of resources. So therefore any racial analysis that we're doing is inherently political economy. I don't think he knew it at the time, but Fogel said this would be political economy scholarship in its full force. And he's absolutely right when we're thinking about that. We are making and attaching and camouflaging political events as social events. And we have to really think then about what we're missing, not only in terms of economic history, but I think of glaring missings that we're taking in political history as well by taking that. This disconnect between social history and economic history is really a false one. If we think, for example, the work um, that, that, that Stephanie um, uh, Jones Rogers is doing about white women being intimately involved in the political economy of slavery, that alters the way that we think about gender as being fundamental to a racial caste system and how white women play a critical role historically and today in the maintenance of white supremacy. If I'm thinking of the work 
in gender studies more broadly about sexual violations of men in enslavement, that gets us thinking about what role violence plays overall that is related to political economy. And that gender violence is not enacted on one gender alone in a racial system that itself is matched to a political economy. Those are all questions that we could really struggle and grapple with as traditional historians and as economic historians. And it has nothing to do with the tools and the methods or even about um, the culture of seminars and the hostility that economists have to sort of ideas, period, and certainly to um, uh, histories and those coming out of their profession, right? But it really is about the work that we should be doing as scholars in this area. So I still go back to this fundamental piece of what is it that we want to accomplish from our scholarship? And then are we actually taking not just the tools, but the perspectives and really the self-reflection that we need into this work? Ultimately, what we have to want to produce is something that's going to do something in the world and be generative. And to do that, we have to dissociate ourselves somewhat from believing that our method is the right one and certainly that our method is the only one that gets to the truth. Because ultimately what we should be thinking about uncovering is understanding our present in light of what the past is telling us, right? That the history that's written in the past and what the events of the past are the past, the perspective that we bring to them tells us much more about where we are at the present. And I think critical engagement with that would lead to much more productive discussions uh, between econ economists e and economic historians and historians. Uh, thank you very much, Trevon. Uh, we've had such a rich material to chew on, uh, not all <laughs> directly relating to each other. My, my task here was going to be to try to pose some follow-up questions for the panel before we open up to general uh, discussion, general uh, comments and questions. However, uh, I was going to raise the issue of race in general, race uh, as an object of analysis in economic history in particular, and Trevon has just given us such an eloquent uh, summary on that. I'm, uh, it almost seems as though any any further comment should be uh, responsive to that. Uh, but uh, so rather than me coming up with a single question, let me just ask among the panelists if someone would like now to make a follow up uh, remark in light of the comments that uh, from the others that you've just heard. The rest, you're unmuted, maybe. Um, I mean, I uh, say so much. I mean, I, I think one of the things that I think about is also the different professional pressures on, econ on economic historians who are getting tenured and promoted in departments that are assessing them on just like counting things that get into the AER and not the gay age. And so the stunting of like what uh the professional career incentives are of economic historians who would i think all love history like none of nobody goes into this without like really uh loving this stuff but really are real really feel constrained and so it's almost like the right audience is all the people that not in this webinar who are like economists that don't care about history but need needing to be able to find like intellectual value in the stuff that's produced by economic historians and maybe books. I think like if we can actually build a culture of book writing in economics again, that might actually, where it is valued for tenure and promotion, uh, that might actually go a long way towards creating that kind of value for that, um, as, just as a thought. Um, yeah, if I could say also, I mean, with regard to books, I think it would go a very long way. And in fact, in economics departments, you know, the book is the thing that you write after tenure, right? And so already a book 
can you know absorb several years and then so already the scholar is you know 10 years out and it's 10 like it's 10 straight years after graduate school by the time you get to write a book and i think that's um you know that i think that i don't i don't know exactly how to create incentives so that that's not the case but if there were a way i think that's that's a good way to go i i would very much endorse that idea of uh writing books. I know the NBER, they say the economic historians are the only ones uh, who write books anymore. Uh, but when you do it, it becomes much harder to hide behind technique or hide behind your focus on one particular hypothesis that you're uh, going to confirm and then do 100 pages of robustness checks. Uh, no, you're, if not compelled, you're at least pushed towards uh, pulling things together uh, and creating a narrative and relating to broader uh, issues and maybe even uh, uh, the uh, present day implications. But of course, it's a lot of work to write a book. So one of my trying to think up a, a, a smaller, more realistic idea uh, for moving things forward would be to encourage economic historians to publish in history journals. Uh, I'm not sure what would happen uh, if uh, that were to be tried on a significant scale. I think they'd get pushback initially from some of the journals. But that might be healthy to have an interaction and trying to re revise your manuscript. Uh, we would face the question that Sherry raised, what would be the incentive to do that? Right? Is it really going to enhance your, uh, your economics career to publish in a history journal? Maybe not. Maybe we could get funding for a research grant to fund, create an incentive uh, to do this, just to see what would happen. Uh, that almost sounds like a caricature. Uh, but it does seem to me that I, I much appreciate uh, Jonathan's uh, optimism and hopefulness here, but it seems to me it's going to take conscious effort on somebody's part. Uh, you can't just say, well, our workshop's open to anybody or something like that. Uh, you need to take some affirmative action uh, in the original sense, in the sense that uh, a group of historians and economic historians to actively convene a joint workshop that would truly be joint and not just uh, one or the other inviting outside parties. Uh, so, uh, Trevon, do you want to comment? Well, I, I was going to say, I think publishing in history journals would be very exciting, um, but I think we have to do so as economic historians, understanding that journal articles play a very different role in the professional development of historians than they do for economists. And so we're dealing with sort of apples and oranges. So I always try to answer this question of if I had a joint appointment in a history department 50-50, um, what would what articles would count where and where, where would the book need to be published like what were the what would the the professional sort of um standards mean each of these disciplines and they're very different um e economists view their articles uh, particularly those that are published in the in, in the most prestigious outlets as basically books right because they have very few of them typically at the time in which they're uh, coming up for tenure right so you you wouldn't have five, if you had five books in a history department you probably should be a full professor or somewhere close to that um, if they're single authored books, right? But if you had five of these you know, in uh, economics, number one, they take several years to publish. And so we're treating, this is actually a sign of something that is wrong. We're treating articles uh, in terms of the length of time to uh, produce and publish them as they are, as if they are books. And so I think that is a very different type of um, knowledge production process in disciplines that it's hard to sort of bridge. Did, Kayla, did you, go ahead. So I was, if someone else wants to jump in right on, on that. Okay, Kayla, you have the floor. Okay, well, so I was, the, I wanted to, before we lost it, I just wanted to like rah, rah on Trevon's point about um, the questions coming out of the present. And this is in a way what I was trying to say about kind of whether we can pretend that our presence or our questions are unlodged from time. 
And I think, you know, once you realize that you're asking the questions because of present circumstances, then you have to realize that those questions are, are always going to be political. And we, and it's not that you want to be biased or political, but you want to acknowledge those politics so that you can give an answer and an answer that's aware of the kind of implications that are out there in the world. And I just, I feel that this is in a way what has really plagued the, um, the slavery and capitalism arguments um, and prevented them from moving forward is a kind of that we remain stuck on a different set of questions that isn't actually one that is really provides a useful set of answers in the present. Um, like I, I, I said this a little bit, but you know, is it, did, did slavery cause capitalism? Well, my goal isn't to defend or attack capitalism per se, if I'm actually interested in race um, and racial injustice uh, over the long run, then I need to ask a different question that's gonna give me a different set of answers to understand how racial hierarchy has been maintained, um, to understand the long run wealth gap in the many places it has come from. So like shifting to how questions rather than if questions, I think create a useful set of tools, tools for like, what is my research gonna do in the world? And thinking about that as if it's, I mean, historians always think that our questions come out of the present. We're like, so like, oh, I asked this question because I did, because of, because of the time that it was. And we're like acutely aware of that. And I think if economists were acknowledging that it would help historians to understand like why the questions, because we see your questions as coming out of the present as well. And that leads us to think, oh, why are you asking this question about slavery and capitalism this way? It's like, oh, because you want to defend capitalism. And it leads us to see a whole set of normative things that I think aren't necessarily the right things that you're actually interested in asking about. It's at the root. But then the other thing, you know, about like, what are these practical things we can do? Well, there is this thing about publishing for each other. One thing that I think is really distinguishes um, economic historians in econ who I have more success talking to is how whether they've spent time in archives or working with primary sources. I think Trevon's point about being careful with sources um, and data is really, really valid, but not always valid. You know, I just read, um, uh, grant applications for the Economic History Association. And like, I mean, this is a historian's reaction, but boy, does everybody wanna, all the grad students wanna hire an RA or ship their you know data off to India for coding. And I think it's really important that economic historians continue to go to archives. Now it doesn't mean that you have to enter every scrap of data yourself, but I mean, how can you come with a skepticism and awareness of context and awareness of politics um, that is always in the data if you just like, you know, scanned it up without ever looking at it and shipped it across an ocean and got back a spreadsheet that's totally decontextualized. So I think that um, like archival training, um, when we're thinking about requirements, like John, I want to have more historians do quantitative methods, but I also would love to see more econs kind of have to be spending time doing primary source analysis and primary source training. Can I chime in on that? So I I, I completely agree that uh, with with the importance of like just the the organic nature of the archive and like seeing connections that you don't necessarily come in with and and um, I wish Ben Schmidt was here uh, who I think is like really interesting uh, in the way of like saying that what digital humanities and digital history does that economic history does not do is offer that same organic presentation of the archive like online, but presenting the information in a way that's not like a rectangular and, and, and pre-formatted, but in a way that lets you kind of encounter that same kind of serendipity that you get from an archival experience, but online. And just kind of saying like, this is a very different aesthetic that a historian brings to like presentation of historical data than a economist does. Could I, could I add to that? Um, so in, in graduate school, I went uh, for six months to Robert Fogel's Center for Population Economics, which uh, used to exist at the University of Chicago. And he had uh, these training grants funded by the NIH for students. Um, and I remember that, you know, we were at the time he was working on projects related to the Union Army data set, which is housed at the National Archives. And I, and I remember that he uh, it was, would always say that you'll never understand this data until you actually go sit in the archives and you're trained by um, the genealogists, like the team of genealogists that he had um, in Vienna, Virginia. And I thought that it was you know, not really 
I, I didn't really appreciate it until I went, until he sent us and I went for, for a month there. Um, and I think that um, one way would be, you know, for uh, sort of tenured established professors um, to create kind of training grants to do exactly that. Like it, the, you know, the incentive just isn't there for, for graduate students necessarily, unless it's, it's made easier by, um, by, by doing that, by impressing upon students that it's really important and valuable. And indeed it is, because like now um, those records are all available online and the scans have been moved to St. Louis, but it, once you kind of have that base of what is a Union Army pension or whatever um, is the archival record, it really it does help. But I think we have to do more to facilitate uh, graduate students actually going and spending the time to sit there um, in archives and, and learn. If I could say one thing about uh, uh, what, what, what Shari is saying is that, you know, the story of that data project itself is coming from asking another question and going back to the archives to find it. You know, Fogel and Steckel were interested in marriage patterns during enslavement, which would be recorded uh, in Union Army veteran pension applications, particularly for widows. That was going to give you evidence of when someone was married pre-emancipation. And then you realize, you know, you could really do something really interesting if you were to link all of these things together. So that entire data project, which is still, you know, bearing fruit today, I was just talking about a project related to that that I'm writing with Shari this week, um, started answering a completely different question that never would have been answered if you simply took scans of the data and exported it somewhere and, and simply had them done in to answer the specific question. So I do think there's another, and I'm, I'm saying this because we have to talk about incentives that graduate students might have to go to the archives and not just the thing that they know is there, but there are the things that you don't know that are there, the additional pieces and the things that you discover only on site that can actually blow your mind as a historian. And many people just get lucky many times in, in the archives or find things that are incredibly useful, but you'll never know if you don't you know, show up yourself to see. Uh, John, you were unmuted, unmuted a couple of minutes ago. Did you want to chime in? Well, yeah, I mean, I have an unformed thought, which goes back to where you started, Gabe, which was, and I'm still reflecting on, on Trevon's comments about race. And, and why is it that when uh, debates between historians and economic historians go to the topic of racism and slavery, why is it that that's the site in which all of our disagreements flare so much and and i don't know if i have a good answer i mean it, but of course that history um is a history of pain and trauma it is on the one hand the most perhaps the most urgent topic that we need to attend to but also the most difficult for a wide variety of reasons having to do with the politics of of, of racism and, and how that shaped this conversation in this Field. I mean, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this, Gavin, because you've worked on these issues so much across your career. And, and you know, you're, you haven't just worked on these issues, you've worked on, you know, other issues as well. But it, it seems to me the debate that seems to concentrate um, on slavery and race, the issues there are, are, are there for other topics as well, but they don't seem to kind of have the same urgency or the same stakes. And I'm just wondering why that is and how that's affected um, these disciplinary divides so much over the years. Um, well, I, I, on slavery, uh, the current debate, to the extent that there is one debate, uh, I'm doubtful that it really is taking uh, the form of a lineup between economics and history. Of course, I didn't accept that back in the 1970s. Uh, Bob Fogel always wanted to frame it that way. I'm the scientist working with the data and giving you these results. You don't want to buy them because you are uh, romantics. Uh, you want to believe in something else. And that was infuriating to me as a fellow economic historian because I was working with the data and I just thought he was uh, framing the question in a misleading way. Uh, in fact, his very transformation, the fact that uh, he got in as a kind of hard nosed supposedly or uh, uh, quantitative economist 
uh, and then wrote half of his uh, long second book uh, about attitudes on the morality of slavery, a long story completely divorced from any real connection uh, to slavery. I just thought that was his way of saying, well, we have just two different worlds here. There's the hard nosed world of real economic life. And then there's the world of more morality. Uh, whereas I thought, well, we need, some, we need something more of a, of a mixture. Uh, however, we, despite what I just said, uh, we should not be focusing, I think, on Bob Fogel's idiosync idiosyncrasies and eccentricities here. Uh, as it fell out, uh, as I said in my opening comments, uh, there certainly was an economics versus history uh, implication. Uh, I, I don't think it's quite a 50 year misunderstanding uh, over one book, even though that was a very striking uh, kind of formulation. Uh, it does seem to me that history at that time was losing its taste for quantification and social science uh, in general. Uh, what I find talking to historians often is uh, that we, we on our side tend to exaggerate the role of time on the cross uh, because it was a big deal uh, in terms of the field of economic history. It, it, it shattered friendships and created a kind of chill so that people didn't want to touch the slavery topic for decades. But within history, it's just something that is barely remembered uh, anymore. Uh, one factor uh, among many. But talking about race, race as a challenging topic to deal with uh, analytically or historically, uh, there too, I don't quite see the present lineup as history versus economics. It's a tough subject for uh, everybody here. And uh, maybe some of the reasons for that have been uh, spelled out. Uh, yes, I've worked on it, but I'm not sure I have uh, any uh, new insights at the moment. I, I, I'll give you one. Uh, this is a, another collection to uh, a paper I'm reading by Warren Watley and Nina Banks, uh, which is about how the non-representation of Black people within the economics profession uh, has caused us systematically to miss out on certain kinds of connections and associations and relationships. I think we have to go quite a ways in order to uh, flesh out that, that understanding, but it is a fact uh, that a kind of uh, a black perspective coming through the economics profession has been very uh, unusual uh, historically. And I think we've missed a lot because of it. Uh, I think uh, we're in our close to our last 15 minutes. So I think we should open it up for general questions. Suresh, I don't know if the system has a system here, but in the absence of one, what I would do is go to the chat and just start calling out names. You think that would work? Yeah, I can. Uh, we see some hands up already, Marlos, for example. Um, so if you want, if you want me to sort of keep the keep the list, I can do that. Uh, if you can do that, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Um, okay, Marlos. Hi everyone, and thanks so much for this very interesting discussion. Uh, it seems like it was a conversation. It was a bit long overdue. Um, even though it's kind of been going on, I think in like smaller circles. Um, uh, so it's really nice to see that there's so many, so many people uh, part of this. I, I wanted to to add a little bit of a of a, of a kind of slightly different perspective, being an Africanist. Um, so the conversation we've had so far is mostly about the American context and all the sensitivities there, but I think that the, the intersection between history and economics um, is, is more complex when we start think, taking into account that, you know, history is a field that works on a geographical division. Um, and that different geographical specializations in the history department tend to have very different levels or different types of sensitivities um, about collaborating with economics. Um, in the African context, the Africanist probably more than um, most subdisciplines in history um, are largely represented by, um, there's a large intersection with uh, anthropology um, and the distance from economics tends to be larger and tend, that gives rise to a whole different questions about whether the tools we're using as economic historians can even be used uh, in this context. So um, I, I wanted to share a little bit like how that has kind of shaped my experience and what I think might be, you know, like 
might be useful for thinking a bit more about like how some of these um, fractures can be repaired. Um, I actually started out in a history department. I, was, I got my PhD in history at Northwestern. Um, I went to an econ department from there and I'm now in a business school. So I've kind of hopped around a little bit. Um, I've always uh, maintained very close relationships with the Africanists, um, both in African studies, uh, area studies programs, um, uh, and also in political science. Um, they tend to come more often to these area studies programs. Um, and I think for me, one of the lessons has been that patience does a lot of good. Um, that even though I was much more worried about um, my colleagues in African history not being willing um, to accept more quantitative work, um, but by taking the time and kind of genuinely building these connections, um, I actually feel like um, this barrier is sometimes greater in our own head than it is in reality. And that's what it takes is in part just um, building that, um, that level of conversation and trust. Um, but I do think it is it, more broadly for the field, it is, is something to think about when we have the conversation of like how to repair bridges between history and economics that um, this may look very different in the context of American economic history than in other parts of the world. Um, arguably, when we're working on developing economies today, the intersections for me are often more often with development economists. Um, they are kind of taking up part of the conversation uh, about um, economic history. So I was curious to see um, uh, what your thoughts on that are and how to move that connection forward. I'll, I'll just say, I could, when, when organizing this, we were kind of trying to keep the focus on the US just because the academic division between economics and history is like much more riven inside the, like in, they still have economic history departments in the UK, for example. And so, uh, we, I, it's, yeah, partly it's like the, the academic structure of the US is also just di different. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't have interesting c comments about it. Um, well, I meant it more as a topic of, of, of inquiry. I mean, it's I understand that the, that the problem is more pervasive in the American economy or in American uh, um, uh, institutions, but um, the working on uh, American economic history is a very different experience than doing this for on, for example, Chinese history or African history. Um, so that when we have this conversation about repairing it, it's I, I'm just worried that this should not be just a conversation between the Americanists in the history department and people studying American economic history in the econ department. This is a broader conversation about how we think about tools that we develop to make sense of the past. And that might that conversation might look different uh, with different, different uh, geographical specializations. I just have one quick thought in response to that. I think you're absolutely right. It, history departments, the historical profession is not in great shape right now. I don't want to go on and on about uh, the job market and et cetera, but my department, a once large, proud world history department is, uh, like many departments, is, is shrinking. Of course, history, because of its uh, commitment to archives, languages, is always going to have traditional space-time fields. Um, but I, I expect, and this is one of the reasons why I'm optimistic about the future of economic history, even within history departments, uh, that thematic fields are going to become more prominent um, in history departments. Um, and as clusters of research um, as and space time fields will become less prominent. That really doesn't address uh, the issue that was was raised marvelous, but I, I think it does mean that it will create more opportunities uh, in all thematic fields, including economic history for historians working across in different space time uh, contexts to uh, to be in collaboration. I would just add that I am always often observing the more collaborativeness of my colleagues across econ history in other fields like you the ones you mentioned, but also like Latin America, the economic history of slavery doesn't have these same um, divisions. And I think that also tells us something about um, john's point about well, why is it that we keep having this fight about slavery in the US well. It isn't just history, 